morning. So I'm going to present a narrative series game that we developed for an ongoing project. I'm going to present the Petro 2.0 a narrative series game for uh, people in the intellectual disability. So Herz Flow is an existing project, it's a series of booklets that was uh, released in 2011. The booklets are currently reworked and digitalized because they are completely outdated. One big point is that they are uh, diversified. They have been and will be used entirely in plain language to enable people to access these materials uh, alone. It's targeted towards uh, teenagers and young adults primarily, but also they are disabled because they have teachers and parents. And uh, the idea was that because of this digitalization, that we could supplement the materials in the series. I'm going to go into why we choose a narrative series game later on. First, I would like to give you a quick overview for uh, the story that came out in the process of this development. The premise is quite simple. Alex likes to read. But Alex is uncertain what those games mean, if it's friendship or love, and if, uh, if you uh, feel the same way, how can they approach you? There are many questions to be answered. Those points are actually all learning objectives of the booklet. So people are uh, viewing the story through the eyes of Alex. And they are finding out about these uh, learning objectives through the narrative of the game. Now, I spoke of diversity. Uh, for that matter, people can choose the gender of Alex and you. They can be male, female, or diverse. And allow for this, uh, this choice, we had to write the story entirely without gender pronouns, which was quite a challenge, but uh, it wasn't the only challenge. For starters, we had an extremely diverse target audience, because intellectual disability is uh, primarily a medical term, it doesn't tell us much. So we had to go and look into how we can create a game that is suitable for the target audience, and um, there was little research on the topic to guide us. So we built on what little was there, but it also gave us an opportunity to gain new knowledge, hopefully. And lastly, it was extremely interdisciplinary. There were many disciplines involved, and not all of them familiar in serious games. Um, what do you see? Oh, you don't see anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> On the left, that you by no means have to read is uh, actually the narrative, the branching narrative. And this was the format that we found that uh, people in the team actually could reasonably read because formats like Twine that are easily readable are easily readable for game designers but not for uh, sexuality education experts. So, including the different stakeholders was key to achieve the game that actually meets the goals. And for that, we used the serious game design framework called Triad Game Design. It uh, proposes three worlds, play, meaning, and reality. And those three worlds that form mm -hmm. the design space. Then each world has uh, experts that are primarily located in those uh, worlds. And from the world of play, Driven by the choices of the player. And the educators, in the form of meaning, they wanted to, to transfer the knowledge in an appropriate and correct way. And for the corner of reality, we have to write the story in a way that is relatable for the target audience. For example, um, it is totally realistic. 
interesting that the party audience uh, can visit a coffee shop with a friend. But things like large nightclubs are not accessible to them. So writing a story with a setting in a large nightclub would have meant that we would miss our role because people see it and then would get discouraged or just not find it relatable. Now for the prototyping, since we had uh, no baseline to go with, we started at zero and we got a new from a paper is that a narrative serial series might be suitable for the target audience because they are inherently slow paced, there is no time pressure and it's also a genre where reflection uh, goes over action. Uh, bachelor students uh, of the Fatwetzel developed uh, a serious game, uh, a narrative serious game to find out if those assumptions actually hold true when they're given to a target audience. And in a play test, uh, they found out that the short answer is yes, that works well. Uh, we did also notice that since choices are the primary interaction of the players, we really had to look into the choices and how to make them interesting and how that would be beneficial within the means of transferring knowledge. And what we also knew is that the target audience frequently struggles in making uh, reflected choices because in their day-to-day -day life they often find themselves uh, with caretakers or parents making choices for them. So when they actually have to make the choice on their own, they often are uncertain how exactly to do that. To take this into account, we decided to only ever give two options per choice to limit, uh, limit this difficulty. And uh, we wanted to make sure that the choices we give them uh, have the potential to really reflect on what we are, what we are doing. We thought uh, dilemmas would be a good way to do that because that takes a lot of reflection, but we found was requiring you to remember a lot of information in order to properly compare your options and the target audience often has limited uh, attention scope so they can't um, hold the same amount of information at once as uh, we can so the dilemmas were really difficult because it's simply too much information at once. Um, however, we did not get enough uh, Credits to express the choices in the beginning, so choices like what, what shirt do you want to wear to the first day. But uh, that is uh, very much a choice that uh, prompted them to reflect because they didn't compare the options and the outcomes. So the, that kind of choice uh, fulfilled also this, um, this requirement that we had in our choices. We then formulated this. Uh, choices uh, into a concept of meaningful choices and said that a choice is meaningful when it prompts people to reflect um, and or when it has an effect on the outcome of the, or on the, on the process of the story. We took all our learnings that we had from the first two prototypes and uh, taught them third and final prototype, the reason for it looking very much needed to hit those buttons again is uh, that we had problems finding a software that would fulfill all our accessibility needs, uh, so we ended up creating the software ourselves with Unity and Yarn Spinner, and in the playtest that we conducted with a group of other target audience, we found that the use uh, worked well, they uh, uh, reported enjoying it and everyone actually finished the game. However, we had uh, two students that the teachers had called us to struggle with making decisions and uh, they needed someone to sit with them and support them in the choice making process. They didn't make choices for them, but uh, we assumed that if they had been doing this alone and they would have faced choices they would have simply quit the game so they are 
interesting that the target audience will always be able to play this game alone. That is something we have to scratch from our requirement as it's simply not uh, realistic. The guidelines and the game are not completely finalized at this point. We have all the content, but it doesn't even get yet, so we have to add uh, final artworks and uh, things like we will be drawing those. Um, we are also currently looking into getting, getting voice actors to speak those different characters uh, because we are using text-to-speech software at the moment. It's not a huge issue because the target audience is used to this kind of voices, but it would uh, help qualitatively actually people spoke In conclusion, we now have a set of preliminary guidelines to design a narrative series games for this target audience. Where, for example, we no longer have a time requirement how long people should take because uh, that varies greatly between individuals. But what we uh, found is useful is to say how many lines of text roughly should be in between. Uh, Key choices so that people stay engaged with the game. It's also important to have a compassion in the end when we wrap up the game so that if people uh, did end up getting confused or struggle, they go out of the game feeling sure and safe about uh, what has just been happening. We also found a participatory approach, mutual beneficial, so both people from the target audience and the subject. Experts were included every step on the way, and uh, without them, it would certainly not uh, come out the way it did. We would like to continue with the play tests because uh, we only have uh, around 70 people that we could test with due to the small size uh, of the classes, and we would also like to look into the play setting. So, I'm alone. Lastly, we would like to create a second prototype with those uh, guidelines to find out if they are really applicable to narrative series games in general. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for your interest. And uh, I was happy to read the title of the next slide because that's happy part and uh, that's what that's for. What Thank you, Adrian, for this great presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Anybody? Okay, I, I have a few. Uh, sorry. Um, you were speaking about sexuality education, um, and there was like based on those leaflets that were uh, used beforehand. Um, did you compare like? Uh, the message we try to convey by the leaflet compared to what uh, your target audience retained from playing uh, with the application? Something that you tried already? No? Um, not in that manner. We did talk to them about uh, what they took from the game and tried to find out uh, what information they retained. And they described concepts like boundaries and the difference between friendship and love. But we did not look into actual um, if they learn something because we need much more participants and uh, long term stuff to do this. Thanks. Um, any other question? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, join me for the link.